Wow. It's very exciting to be here and uh, be with you all. Uh, I'll be honest, I prayed for most of you this week because I just prayed through the directory and uh, most of you look a lot better than in your pictures. <laughs> It's a blessing. Um, it, it's also hard because uh, uh, Gwen and Justin and uh, our youngest daughter is still up in Ottawa. Our youngest daughter Mia is going to the University of Ottawa. She's going to her third year there. So she's staying there. And we haven't sold our house yet. So keep praying for that. I'm heading back this afternoon for a couple of days to tie up some loose ends. And uh, I know protest on my street. My house hasn't sold yet or something. Um, but uh, we're just looking to the Lord and uh, we've had a few people say, well, you know, have you been praying? Your house isn't sold. I said, well, I said, uh, sometimes it's really nice when God just kind of answers a prayer like that. Uh, to be honest, it doesn't take much faith. When you're going through stuff, that's when you pray more, you learn more. And God just does the measure more than all we ask for man because he surprises us. So I'm waiting for the surprise. <laughs> I'm honest with you. Um, some of you were here 30 years ago, and I apologize for those sermons that uh, you reached back to. But I'm really excited. Gwen and I are very excited about being here. And uh, uh, this Sunday, the, the message is really just an introductory message, some things that are really important in my life as I follow Jesus. And then next week, we're going to start a series from Nehemiah. And uh, the series is going to be called Building to Transform. That will take us up into Christmas, a Christmas series, and then, uh, um, and then after Christmas, uh, and in the new year, we'll be doing a kind of a family, very uh, kind of series. I, I, I really believe the local church has to get back to teaching what the Bible says about marriage and family and uh, about living godly lives when it starts there in the family. Um, so we can be in prayer about those things. Uh, we've had a lot of complication over the last few weeks. I became a grandfather again last week. I know I look too young to be a grandfather. <laughs> and I appreciate all of those that are thinking that and then some of you aren't, but that's okay. <laughs> And so my son, uh, Nathan, and his wife, Sarah, had their second child. They have uh, a little guy named Sam who uh, is not quite two yet. Now he has a sister, Nora. And he's a pastor up in Huntsville. And then uh, our oldest daughter and her husband, uh, our oldest daughter is Natalie, and her husband, uh, Nate. Um, you try to figure out all the names of my family. Uh, we have a hard time sometimes. They had a little girl back in December, and he starts his new ministry. He started on September the 1st, as I did. And he was my worship pastor up in Ottawa, and now they're at Orangeville Fellowship Church there, so the Alliance has lost two really good pastors. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and then my daughter Mary, who, Jason, I, I told you not to say anything. But we'll work up with him. Uh, she's here, uh, and she's living with uh, our cousin right now, just as she's looking for work down in southwestern Ontario. And, uh, and then we have the dog and daughter, and, and Justin this week. <coughs> Funny story about Justin. Uh, this week he's been up at NBC. Gwen's um, been up um, seeing the granddaughter and everything. On his way back with his mom to Ottawa, he said, So, Dad's coming home this weekend. Does that mean I'm moving with him to Woodstock and you're staying here, Mom, until the house sells? So, he's anxious to get to pray for him because he has to go back to his old school. And uh, so, uh, I just like prayers and all those things. And uh, but we're just glad that we're here. We're going to pray and get right into the message this morning. And I uh, hope you have your Bibles and your outline this morning. Uh, my deal is when there's kids in the church, they get chocolate after the service. But they have to answer kind of two questions, one of two questions this morning. Uh, basically, uh, well, maybe have a couple of the young adults up here on JC myself. And just two questions. What's our mission as, as a church? And uh, what's our call as a follower of Jesus? 
So hopefully I make that very clear. So what's the mission of the church? And what's our call as followers of Jesus? Let's pray. Father, as we uh, pray this morning, uh, it's a great day. You have uh, led us as we've been singing today. And of your great glory and how you just work in each of our lives. And we are thankful for how you have worked in the life of this church for such a long time. And what a privilege it is for me to be the lead pastor of this church. Uh, having been friends who pastor here, having an incredible mentor in my life who pastor here, uh, we are blessed. And we're blessed together. So, Father, uh, as Ron just said this morning, um, Father, give us incredible years together. As we follow you, as we look to you. We, we just want to pray for all the churches in our city today. We pray for the pastors there who bring the word of God. And when there's, where there's confusion about that, Father, we pray that you bring revival to your church. And Father, that people will be called back to follow Jesus. Pray for our country today, Father. There's an election coming up. A lot of things going on. <coughs> Father, we need a call back to you in this country. Then we think of the dear people, Muslims, Christians, just secular people who are trying to get out of countries that are so oppressive and violent. Thank you, Father, for Germany and Austria just opening their doors to these people, showing them love and care. We, we pray, Father, for a mighty revival uh, in Europe. I pray for brother pastors in the Arabic churches. There are many of them who I know and have ministered with that they would just see their congregations explode as Muslim people become Christians, Father. You have got them moving for a reason. And we know that the gospel is the thing that changes their life, takes away their fear, gives them faith and hope and love and joy in their life. So we just pray for the churches there, the Christians there, that they would just have open arms to these two people. For us today, Father, um, we pray that you would renew us. There are people here that have gone through very difficult things, as, as I've been hearing this week already. We just need to pray for one another, encourage one another, build one another up, Father. So I just pray that where there's tension in families or people have lost loved ones, maybe there's tension at work, there's transition happening. Uh, Father, I just pray that you would bring peace in all these situations. We love you, Lord. That's why we're here. And for those of us who are just kind of seeking you, trying to figure out what it means to follow you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just do your work today. I can't do it. No one else can but you. So we just pray, Father, that your Spirit, spirit would just move and just bring Jesus into the hearts of people today. Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I understand that my good friend Don Howard said that very few times do pastors get a hundred percent vote. And I also understand from some of the conversations that he said no leader can be at 100%. And I know that. I was very interested and blessed by the leaders that I met here initially, uh, the search team, the board, uh, the leadership team, the greater leadership team. And uh, I'll be honest, I was very excited about working with all the leaders. They reviewed my resume, and my resume looks pretty good. They contacted my references, and those references love me, I know that. They maybe even went further and checked other things, but the one thing they forgot to do was to check my failure resume, because it's very long. I'm very thankful that my sinful resume has been taken care of by Jesus. But my failure resume is long because I've been a Christian leader a long time and there have been times where 
Oh, I'll tell you I feel miserable. But God's always taught me through those things. So, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have wanted me as your pastor. You had George Bradford back there. I had an incredible summer with him and with George Boyd that summer. But uh, it's taken me 30 years of development to get back here. Or, in some cases, for you to invite me back to speak. How's that? But last week I was in a PhD class and we were talking about biblical leadership. And our prof, who's a Hebrew and Greek scholar and just a godly man, uh, and I go to a school that's not really known that well, it's a smaller school and it has mainly semi-retired Christian professors who've been at it a long time. And I basically chose to go there because these guys have been through more stuff in their lives and I wanted to be mentored by them because I still have a lot to learn. So in the process of that class, we began the first two hours just talking about what is a biblical leader? What is a godly leader? And each one of us kind of put in different things about who that person is like and what their characteristics are. And we came up with different things. Well, they have great character. Um, and then we kind of talked about what is the world want in a leader. And we found out that, well, they, they need to be good looking on television. You know? They need to be charismatic. Uh, they need to be really into themselves. There's a whole number of things that we got talking about. And then we started driving down to what's a biblical leader. And uh, so we said, well, they're a servant, they're spiritual, uh, they're submitted, they're accountable. We went through all of these things. And for about two hours, and our teacher just let us go. And it was a very, much more a, what I would call a Hebrew style of learning rather than a Greek style of learning. And you know what the difference is between our school system, for the most part, is built on a Greek system where it, as long as you're gaining knowledge, you're going to mature. A Hebraic kind of learning system is very different, uh, as we'll see in just a few moments, because not only is there knowledge, but what the right use of knowledge leads to obedience to God. And uh, so it's not just knowledge accumulation, it's all about us hearing listen. So where do I get that from? Where did my prof get that from? So this is very fresh for me this morning. So we're going to learn together and uh, then we'll get some key things uh, for this message that basically I've called Mission Calling. And as followers of Christ, God has a mission calling through each one of us. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. And uh, as you will see, uh, I'm just going to look at one word this morning up there, and then take us to Matthew 28. And uh, I hope to be done by 1 o'clock. I haven't preached for two and a half months, so I'm like full, I'm ready to go. Okay? So we'll get to communion, don't worry. And kids, we'll get to the chocolate a little later too, so don't worry about that. Now, as you go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws... The, the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. And then it says this, Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Then here it is. here's the, the Hebrew word again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Verse that most of us who have been living as Christians for a long time have memorized. And then it says, these commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your bed. And as we uh, talk through this whole thing about a godly leader, our, our prof came down to 
this one word here. I mean, when you ask the question, what is the mark of a godly leader or a follower of Jesus Christ or a godly church, what's the bottom line? Well, this word that is used here, a Hebrew word, Shema. Isn't it a great word? Sounds nice too, doesn't it? Shema. It, it, it's actually a double meaning word. It goes beyond hearing. It means to hear and obey. It's uh, in your notes that you can just say it's, it's listening and obeying the Lord. That's what Shema means. Uh, that, that's the mark of a godly leader, of a godly follower of Jesus Christ, of a godly church. They are listening and obeying the Lord. And, and our prophet just kind of like, just kind of was nailing us with this. It doesn't matter what you look like on television. It doesn't matter your track record because he, he said, look at the leaders that God called to himself. Most of them had some sort of past, didn't they? They had failure resumes. And uh, the other thing that we noticed was that most of these leaders were reluctant to lead. Ever notice that in the scripture? They're all reluctant. They're not like today where there's a lot of people just want to be a leader. So they strive and strive and strive and strive and strive to be a leader. But the godly leaders are those who are most reluctant. I look for them in the church. I usually pick them first. Not the first one that comes into my office. I usually look, okay, I, I watch for a little while and I see. And I usually, when I go and talk to them about a position or something like that, they go, oh, oh, oh I, I can't do that. I go, oh, great. Do the one I want. Because I know this about them. They're listening. And they will obey the Lord. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line for a godly church. That's the bottom line for a follower of Jesus. Uh, that, that's the bottom line for anyone who's a servant leader in the church. We're just listening and obeying the Lord. So you don't really hear until you obey. You, you remember our parents, okay, and, and, and some of you kids that are in here as well. You'll hear this from your parents. Are you, do, do you hear me? Do you hear me? They, they just don't want you hearing them, do they? What are they after? They, they want you to hear and obey. Okay? It's amazing how our parents get very Hebrew about stuff. Isn't that cool? It's, it's hearing and obeying. Right? To really hear is to obey. It, it, it's, 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 it's such an important thing. That's our call. That's our call. I mean, Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 11. 1. He, you know, he basically in, in your notes, and I kind of jumped ahead. See, that's my inexperience of preaching the last two and a half months. Not following my own one. But you see Jesus bringing us back in Matthew 22, where we're just to love God and love others. That's kind of the bottom line, right? If you're truly listening and obeying God, we love God, and we love others. It's really simple. That's what the spirit filled life is all about. And then, then you see this, this kind of laid out for us too in the scriptures about what godly leaders do in the local church. In uh, Acts chapter 6, we, we see the problem there that the early church had a number of widows and people that they wanted to, to care for. And, and so in Acts chapter 6, you know, the, the leaders of the early church, the elders there, they just pray together and they seek God, and God gives them an answer to that particular problem. And if you have time this afternoon, just read through that. But there's something that's said here that helps me to, to remind me what my, my role is and the role of elders and, and key leaders within the church. In verse 3 of, of Acts 6, it says, Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to what? Prayer and the ministry of the Word. And so, what an effective pastor does within the body of Christ is that I want you to connect with God. 
I want, I want you to be able to pray. So last night I came here for a couple hours and I just prayed for everybody. It was quite a, kind of quiet here. You know, I'm used to Ottawa. I'm driving through the streets here. There's no one out. You know, it's quiet. It's so much different to me. And I come in here and I had the directory open. I'm just praying through. Praying for the church. Praying for myself as I start here. And, and then Mike came in about 9 o'clock. Just to make sure everything was okay. I think he wondered why there's some lights on still later. Because uh, I'm going to teach you how to pray. Uh, notice that, they, that if God and leaders do something else. They minister the Word of God. They're not just preaching the Word of God. Anybody can want to preach. There's a big difference between ministering the Word of God and preaching the Word of God. Ministering the Word of God helps others to grow in their knowledge of the Word of God so they, they can handle the Word of God properly so you can be a self-eating Christian. And so you can minister to others in your own unique way and with your gifts to others. And then the last thing really, and it's a mark of these leaders that they choose, they are full of the Holy Spirit. They are yielded to the Spirit of God and they are yielded day by day, moment by moment to the Spirit of God. That's what the Spirit-filled life is. It's not based on our gifts, it's more based on our character and the fruit of the Spirit, using our gifts and our talents to honor the Lord. And so, one of the things I'm going to teach is how to live the Spirit of God. If I do those three, thing, those three things well, then God's going to do something. Why? Because what do God need leaders? What's the goal? It comes in Ephesians chapter 4, where God gave some of the apostles and teachers and pastors and evangelists and the goal of that is to help people, what? Become mature in Christ. That's what Ephesians 4 drives to. We will do ministry together. I'm not, a, I'm not a pastor that tries to do all the ministry. I can't do it. I know there's certain things that God has called me to do to help us all be ministers together and use our gifts and abilities for the mission. So what is this mission? Well, most of you will know this. And if I ask the question, you know, what's the, the purpose of the church? Um, I've got different answers as I've consulted with churches and worked with churches over the years. Some of the answers are very intriguing. Well, uh, we were to glorify the Lord. Yeah, that's, that's true, but that's not the mission of the church. I have had other people say, well, we're to, to, to give and have a good bank account and make sure that, uh, you know, we're basically good with the government. That's, that's not the mission of the church. Uh, I've had people say, well, have a good attendance, have a nice building, have cash in the bank. Uh, the, uh, those are what I call the North American ABCs of effective churches. But God changes it up. And Jesus changes it up in Matthew 28, 18-20. You turn there quickly just to refresh your memory, and then we'll finish really quick. But this is important stuff that I'm going to be expanding on over the year through this, some different things. And most of us know this. We, we hear this all the time in missions conferences, mission speakers come in, and we think that the mission of the church is over there when God has called this church in 1890 to be in the mission here. And this church's name changed and became Oxford Baptist Church. I believe, not just because of the street, or it didn't become Hunter Street Baptist Church, I believe it became Oxford Baptist Church to reach the county of Oxford. And those people back then had a bigger vision of just having a street church. How many of you were founding members of the church back then in 1890? <laughs> right? Oh, okay. So all of you are new, like me. Good, good, good. Those people had they understood the mission. What is the mission of the church? Well, look what Jesus says. All authority in heaven, okay, uh, verse 18. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. To me, he said. Therefore, 
Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And notice this part, that we skip this. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the earth. I'll explain that part in a moment. But what is the mission of the church? Sing songs of praise? No. Have a pastor? No. It's make disciples. Make disciples. See people who are lost come and follow Jesus. Not a pastor, not a church. Come and follow Jesus as the Lord and Savior of their life. And to live a life that's in the power of the Spirit of God. And Jesus lays that out for us. That's the mission for every local church. If any local church gets off that mission, they become apostate. They start doing crazy stuff in order to attract people rather than just make disciples. And there's certain reasons for that that I'll talk about in just a moment. So what is the mission of the church? Okay, I've got that. And then Jesus gives us a strategy. There are, there are people that say that Jesus had no strategy about min, mission and ministry, but you see it. If you study the Gospels, you just see how Jesus ministered to people. The broken people around Him, the hurting people around Him, the prideful people around Him, those who are in sexual immorality around Him. It didn't matter. He just still had the same strategy with all of those people. And it's pretty cool, really. And it's a simple strategy. Just, just like our calling it is just to, to listen and obey, just like the, the mission of the church is to make disciples, he just gives us a simple strategy. Right here in these verses. The first one is this. How do we make disciples? By first of all reaching the lost. And then G Jesus, you know, I, I just love how he kind of lays this out. You see it over and over again as he just interacts with people. And, and uh, Luke 19, and, and verse 10, and, you know, he says, Today salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save, what? Well, it was lost. It was lost. I've had some fun this week when I've had to go into a store. And I'm at the cashier, and you know what the nice thing about Woodstock is? People talk to you. It's so exciting. Down to the market yesterday and met some of you. Jan, you're here this morning. So, if you, I missed a few of you. The others, I heard some of you down there. But I walked into the one store and and, uh, and it was in the grocery store and I said to the cashier, you know, this is my first day shopping in Woodstock. <laughs> I'm sure she thought I just got out of prison. <laughs> and I said, I'm so excited to be here. I'm starting a new job this week. She said, are you working at Toyota? <laughs> and I said this, my first car was a Toyota. But I'm working at a much better place.
But it's just an easy conversation to open up things about Jesus. That's all it is. We just have to be more friendly, more hospitable as church people. We, we just need to bless people because that, it's about reaching the lost, right? And then it's about building believers. Uh, when they come to Christ, we disciple them. And I was discipled as a, as a believer. I, I, I've had incredible men and women in my life who made such a difference in my life over the years. Uh, to teach me how to peer care and just peer share. And that's what that word baptizing is all about. Because when somebody is truly saved by Christ, they, they are baptized and then they are part of a local group of people who are going to care for them and feed them. As Jesus says to Peter, remember, in, in the last chapter of John, he just says, feed my lambs, right? And that's building believers up. And then that's helping them practice the one another's. And there are 59 one another's. 13 of them are just love one another. If we just do that one over and over again, what would the, what would happen in, in this county for God if the churches would just love one another and love the people around them? Because people are desperate for love. I was just thinking about the one my friend Gary Carter and I were talking the other day about it. And, and he says, you know that, that one greet one another with a holy kiss? That's one of the one of the others. You know? And uh, it really just means connect with people. It doesn't just mean saying hello, how are you? Everybody says good, and then we leave. That, 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 that one another gets us to connect with people and take time to connect with people. So good churches for the most part. I've been in some that are not very good at this, just greeting people on the way in. Some are good, some are not so good, but you know what is more effective? How we greet and care for one another on the way out. So if you hear from somebody they've gone through a very difficult time, you have an opportunity right there, right now, to pray with them. Not to say you're going to pray for them, Pray for you. That's greeting one another with all the kiss. That's ministering to one another, encouraging one another. Maybe phoning them after you've heard. How are things going this week? And, and, and that's building believers. It's reaching the lost. And then there's training and equipping workers because I believe that every person who knows Christ is a minister. We're all gifted. We're all talented in different ways. We are all given the same spirit in which to drink. And so we are given the fruit of the spirit. And as a result of that, all of us, everyone is a minister. We are all on the care team. We're all on the outreach team of the church. And he says, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And basically, Jesus uses the Greek form of the word shima. Shema. Not just give them knowledge about my word, teaching them to obey. And then the last thing is just multiplying and sending out servant leaders. And there's a, two passages of scripture I just love. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus sends out the 12, the 12 apostles of the 12 senior pastors. Sends them out. Then he spends time with them. And then in Luke 10, he sends out the 72. He's kind of excited about that. Did you know that? Because in Luke 10, they come back, they start telling Jesus about the ministry that they've been having amongst the people. They don't have seminary de degrees. They haven't been listening to Charles Stanley for 25 years. These people have just listened and obeyed and gone to wherever God would take them. And then they come back and, and it says that Jesus is full of what? Joy. Because they get it. They just get it. Just ordinary things. They didn't have a big budget. They didn't have this. They didn't have that. They just went and ministered to people. The cashier, the people down in the market. They just go, Lord, give me eyes to see these people. Just give me eyes to see them. Whoever I need to minister to today or encourage in any way, just, I'm open. Give me opportunity. And the 72 do that. And Jesus was always about multiplying leaders, sending them out to serve. 
Because God's called us, whether you want to believe it or not, to be an outreaching church. To reach people. Correct? Right? I'm sure we've we got big rocks to tackle in the next few years. That's okay. Th those are easy if we listen. Okay? If, if, we, if we're just strict to reaching the lost, building believers, training and equipping workers, God just blesses. Notice what Jesus says here in Matthew 28. He says, I am with you. How is he with us? Only when we're following through on his strategy. So the churches that I've been in, they're not winning the lost, they're not building believers, they're not multiplying and training workers and not, not seeing the leaders develop. Guess what? You don't sense the presence of God in them. They complain about how, how much they don't have rather than what they do have in Christ. And there's a big difference here. See, the bottom line for a church is not ABC, attendance, buildings, and cash. When I asked an elders board once, you know, what is the bottom line of a church? A guy said to me, as long as we have good money in the bank, we're good. And I said to him, you were so wrong. I said, the bottom line for any healthy church that's on the mission call is basically this, transform lives. Why do I say that? If you go back to Acts chapter 2, the early church was following the strategy of Jesus. They were listening and obeying God. And it says at the end of that particular passage, as they were committed to the apostles' teaching, as they were committed to meeting with each other in each other's homes and going from home to home, it said this about that particular church. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being what? Saved. I've been around Woodstock a while already, and I realize there's a lot of lost people here that need Jesus. There's some Christians that have kind of walked away from things too, that need to come back into community and fellowship and keep growing in them. But the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. If all the churches in this county that love Jesus would just follow his strategy, that's what we would see. That's what we would see. Um, I understand that the membership of this church is 100% in with me coming. I'm in 100%. The only way we can keep at that level or near that level it's just by these two things are call, hearing, and obeying the Lord. Our mission is just to make disciples by winning the lost, building believers, equipping and training workers, and multiplying servant leaders. Because if we just do these two things on the mission call and follow Jesus' strategy at 100%, God is going to do immeasurably more than all we ask. That's the amazing thing. I'm excited about being here. I hope you're 100 percent in. Not with just your vote, but with your heart, your mind, and your soul, as we love God together and love one another and love the people God puts in our way every day. Let me pray. Father, you love us all so much. You love this church. I love this church. And I thank you for it. As we come around your table today, Lord, and we share in communion together, we realize that we are here today because of Jesus Christ and what he's done. We are to pattern our lives after him. He listened. He obeyed. He made disciples. He loved lost people. He built believers. He trained and equipped workers. And he multiplied our leaders. And we're thankful for that. Lord, as we come around the table today,
Maybe we reflect on our call. Maybe we reflect on our mission, both personally and as a church and as leaders as well, that it all comes back to you, Lord Jesus. So lead us by your Spirit through this time. Help us to reflect on our walk with you. Help us to repent of sin if we need to. Help us just to be listening to what you have to say. And we thank you, Father. We praise you and we adore you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. May the Lord add to our number daily, Lord.